Welcome to the Stan Simpson Show, a program about Connecticut people and compelling issues. Make it a point to drop it every week. What are the prospects for an economic recovery in 2011? Economist Fred McKinney joins us with his insight on President Obama's deal with Republicans, the plight of Connecticut small businesses, and the economic crisis facing Governor-elect Dan Malloy. In our second segment, giving voice to young people is something that Hartford Area's Rally Together is doing with its popular open mic nights. There, Hartford's talented teens can display their talents in music, poetry, theater, and dance. We'll talk about the impact of open mic nights in the capital city with Katie Machoy. Then we'll wrap things up. Talking about UConn sports, the big New Year's Day bowl game, the streak of the women's basketball team, and the surprising upstart men. But first, is the economy poised for recovery in 2011? Fred McKinney, Dr. Fred, our regular contributor, economist by mm-hmm. trade, and one of the key spokespeople for the Minority Business Association. Mm-hmm. Your thoughts, 211, you're hearing different indicators. What can we expect in the new year? Well, I, I think 2011 is going to be too, better than 2010. Can't get any worse, right? It, it can get worse, <laughs> believe me. It can always get worse. No, but I think we'll be much better in 2011 than we are in 2010. Why? Well, for several reasons. The, the, the economy is cyclical in nature, okay? Uh, it almost doesn't matter what is done in Washington there would be eventually some rebound. And because the, you know, the U.S. economy is an economy based on the private sector, there are some natural things that happen during a recession. One of the things that happens is businesses have a tough time. Some of them go out of businesses. The businesses that survive, though, they survive because they, they tighten their belt. They reduce their employment. The owners take less. And as a result, they survive. Can't grow them, right? They, they, but if they survive. Mm-hmm. And that's the, that's the key thing. They've got to survive. Mm-hmm. And what happens is that sooner or later there will be some, some pickup in, act, in economic activity. And when that happens, those businesses that were barely surviving, that did survive, will begin to see some profitability. As they see profitability, their productivity increases. But sooner or later... The, those businesses will begin to employ people, mm-hmm. and that's what I think is going to happen in 2011. But they need money, Dr. Fred, right? These banks, I'm hearing, yeah, you're the economist, yeah. I'm hearing that these banks are sitting on a ton of money, millions of dollars, right. and millions. they're afraid to release the money because it's a confidence game. Right. Well, the, the banks are, have, every, have a lot of incentives to lend money right now. I mean, interest rates are the lowest they've been in years. For some markets, like uh, mortgages, they're, they're the lowest they've been in in record. But folks, even with good credit, are saying, right. listen, I got great credit and I'm right. still being put through the ringer. That's right. Well, the banks were put through the ringer, uh, some of them because of their own behavior, but they had a difficult, they were part, they were right in the center of the crisis that we had going back to 2008, 2009. Uh, but it's true that credit is tight. But, you know, everything that I'm hearing from large financial institutions and small financial institutions is that they want to lend money. And I think in many respects, the problem is not with the banks. The problem is with the regulators. Mm. The regulators are, are on top of the banks and, and saying that, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. And so in many respects, the banks have one hand tied behind their back. So then who tells the regulators, hey, guys, take your foot off people's throat, ease up the reins. Who's the one who tells those guys? Is well, it that's the boss. That's right. The boss has got to gotta send a message. Congress has to send a message because, you know, what happened when the banks essentially collapsed, when the financial system in this country almost collapsed, it did. I mean, we were that close to a real financial collapse. The, everyone was pointing fingers. Well, the fingers got pointed at the regulators, whose job it is to, is to protect right. the public interest. Well, they, they did a miserable job at protecting the public interest. So now what do you see? Okay. There's an overreaction. <laughs> so, so now they're just trying to make sure that it never happens again. But in the process of ensuring that it never happens again, nothing happens. How about this now? The government bailout of the car industry, very mm-hmm. much criticized. Now right. you're seeing signs that, you know what, right. it actually is working. The That's industry's right. coming back and that the government bailout was. Quick thoughts. Oh, yeah. I think that there are times when the government has to be aggressive and step into the private sector and do these types of things. I think it was appropriate with the, what the uh, administration did in the car industry. It was appropriate with what they did in the banking industry. I mean, you don't like to have these huge transfers of money from, the, from taxpayers to large financial institutions.
institutions. But the fact of the matter is, if you want a private economy, you have to have a, you, it requires a healthy financial sector. And if you didn't do that, you go from a great recession to a depression. Oh, right? no question. No question. I mean, it, it, you know, the alternatives to what we did were banks closing, you know, people not being able to get any of their cash out of these mm -hmm. institutions. And, and, and a complete loss of confidence on the part of, of investors, on the part of savers, on the part of, of just regular people. Speaking of confidence now, a lot of Democrats losing confidence mm -hmm. in the president, President Obama. You have Republicans right. coming into the mix now. A deal cut last week where the right. president basically acquiesced here, went back on his promise. Right. He's going to continue the Bush tax cuts right. in exchange for continuing the unemployment benefits. Right. Your thoughts on that whole package? Not approved yet, but yeah. cut the deal. Yeah, exactly. I think the, uh, the, the problem here is that... Uh, the president's in a tight spot, and I don't want to be an apologist for the president, mm -hmm. but, and you know, I'm not sure what I would do in his position, but, you know, he had to make a deal on unemployment. That is, you know, we could not have the the numbers of people who were who were threatened to lose their unemployment without any support. A lot of folks out there, right? And so, you know, the Republicans pretty much had them over the barrel. Now, you know, to the Democratic base, the liberal base of the Democratic Party, at least, you know, this was a, an unseemly deal because the fact of the matter is, you know, you've got uh, the top 1% of American taxpayers that pay essentially 16% of their income in federal taxes. What's so bad about that? Well, what's so bad about it is that I think you, in, an, in, a, in a society where you have to have shared responsibility. I think that it is important uh, for the safety and for the soundness of the whole economy for those who have the ability to share their appropriate uh, burden for the operation of the government. Otherwise, they wouldn't have the wealth that they have. In about 30 seconds, the extension now, the unemployment benefits, mm -hmm. pro and con for that quickly. Well, I think you, I mean, this is an emergency method, a mess. This is emergency. I mean, we have a situation that... A couple of lifelines been put out there nowadays, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, we, and, and we're gonna have, we may have to do another one. Mm. I mean, in this state, we have an unemployment rate of about 9.3%, 9, 9 9.4%. But if you included all the people who are discouraged, the unemployment rate would be 20%. And if you, if you looked at some of the urban areas in the state, the unemployment rate would be closer to 40%. Right. So we have some serious challenges uh, in the state and in the country. And so, but if you take money away from people, then, you know, there's no spending. And it only has a, a, a cyclical, a, an increasing effect on the, on the, on the problem. Fifteen seconds. The final thing on what I call Dr. Fred's plate, all these issues we talked right. about. The final thing, Governor Dan Malloy, Governor-elect Malloy. Faces a major crisis here in Connecticut, an economic crisis, $3.5 billion debt, 10% unemployment, uh, achievement gap, the largest in America, uh, people fleeing, the, uh, you know, the young people fleeing. What do you tell him? You're an economist. If he sits you down and says, Dr. Fred, what's your advice to me? You tell him what? Well, again, I'm not a politician, but what I would tell him is the deficit is not the major problem. The deficit is a legal problem, not an economic problem. In fact, in fact, if he goes about treating the deficit as the number one problem, it's going to make that matters worse. Well, explain that. We because, have okay, well, it's going to make matters worse because it, it, what's the solution? The solution is to raise people's taxes or to cut spending. Okay, that's really right. the, the only th two things you can do, or to grow out of it. Well, in a recession, it's not good policy in general to cut uh, spending or to increase taxes. What do you do? Well, I, I think that there are some things that he can do um, to uh, streamline uh, government. Government should become more efficient. They should always be more efficient. But, but can, can you streamline without really cutting realistically? Can you streamline government to more efficient without really cutting duplication? Well, I, I think that there's some there's some fat everywhere. Right. And so I think he could probably find some. He's not going to find $3.5 billion, but he can find some. He can make some progress towards that. But I think what we see here is that we've got a fundamentally bad law because the deficit is there because the economy stinks. If the economy was better, this deficit would largely go away. But chicken egg, how do you get the economy going? Well, you don't, you, don't, yes, so you, don't, egg, right? you don't get it by increasing people's taxes or, or cutting spending. You need you to don't. create new jobs, You right? need to create what new jobs. What are the new hot sectors coming in from your vantage point? What are two hot sectors coming in that Connecticut is not paying attention to or should be putting more effort into? Well, I can tell you it's not manufacturing, construction, or finance. If you look at our Connecticut economy right now, it, it's what I call a sick and tired economy. <laughs> We've got 
health care that's growing, and we've got hospitality that's growing. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe we need to be spending more of our efforts. Sick and tired. Be, I like a that. sick and tired economy, right, too, well, in health care. Yeah. I like that. We'll have to you know, copyright that. Sick that, and tired. I, I should. All right. He's got the <laughs> we'll come back and talk about how popular open mic nights are giving voice to heart for youth. Don't go away. You're watching The Stan Simpson Show.